Merci. Thank you. It's uh, a real pleasure uh, to be here. Thanks to, thank you to uh, FCM for inviting me. Actually, thanks for inviting me back. Uh, it was uh, a little over a year ago that we got together uh, like this in Vancouver. Uh, but uh, as I look across the room, I'm happy to report that there are a lot more familiar faces uh, this year than there were last year, because in the past 12 months, I visited uh, 91 cities, towns, and communities all across the country, about a third of all Canadian ri federal ridings. Uh, I thought about listing them for you, but then uh, I saw that new Tim Hortons commercial, and it's pretty much the same thing. Mais Pour rester dans l'esprit du positivisme now, politique, to remain positive, politically speaking, I'd like to talk to you a bit about what the Conservative government has been doing properly in terms of municipalities. In their 2013 budget, the government announced that it intended to index to inflation the, um, to the gas tax transfer, $2 billion, and this was uh, put in place, I must say, by the Liberal government. Indexation is something that your federation asked for for a long time. It was a just, a fair and reasonable request. The government also made a wise choice when it agreed uh, with the band, uh, bandwidth uh, programs would be put in place. Those are good moves as far as they go. Unfortunately, they don't go far enough. Let's talk about the new Building Canada Fund. The Conservatives boast that the total of the new 10-year fund has never been bigger, and yet they've slashed available funding by nearly 90% in the first year. So last year, there were $1.7 billion available for infrastructure projects. This year, the Conservative government is only investing $210 million. 210 million can build about seven highway interchanges, but it doesn't cover the cost of building even one subway station. It barely covers the cost of one water treatment plant. In a best case scenario, 210 million would build a thousand homes, but in Calgary, for example, we know that there are about 3,500 3, people who are homeless on any given night. And remember that 210 million is not what the government has set aside just for a mid-sized city like Peterborough or Moncton. This is all the available funding uh, available to Canada over the next year. There are plans to spend more down the road, but according to the government's own plan, you'll have to wait another five or six years before you see it. I believe it's irresponsible at a time when our towns and cities are starved for capital to cut our core infrastructure program by close to 90 percent. It moves the government closer to a balanced budget in an election year, sure, but it does nothing to generate economic growth, stimulate job creation, or to improve the quality of life for Canadians. What's more, it's clear the new fund was built without actually listening to municipal leaders, and it shows. Why, why are some essential projects, like local road upgrades, no longer eligible for funding? Where are the reassurances that a fair share of the money will actually be invested in municipal projects? I'm not saying there's a perfect way to do anything, and I'm not saying either that one person or one party will have all the answers. But we can't do anything if the will isn't there to do it. When your federation proposed to the Conservative government to sit down at the table and talk about the best way to design and implement the new funding plan, the government did not respond. This, de this decision had repercussions for all of you here, and therefore for every person who you represent. The same applies to all the people that I represent as the MP for Pepino, the most urban riding in the country. Even before the 1st of April, the deadline, the Liberals were demanding that the Conservatives uh, cancel these radical cuts. 
we once again ask the Minister of Finance to do this. But more, in a time when infrastructure is so important, why have they made accessing this program so much more difficult and confusing? At our most recent policy convention in Montreal, Liberal delegates voted in support of a resolution to expand infrastructure investments, spending by or facilitated by the federal government by up to 1% of GDP per year. Grassroots Liberals are pushing us on this issue because that's the level of investment we'll need to have in place if big regional projects like Metrolinx's big move are to make it past the planning stages. And greater investment is certainly needed if we want infrastructure that can withstand the challenges that come hand in hand with climate change. Liberals are still in the business of building our plan for 2015, and it's premature to promise specific dollars and cents. But by listening to people in communities all across Canada, we've established a set of principles that must guide our decision-making process. In the simplest terms, we know that infrastructure funding needs to be substantive, predictable, and sustainable. Substantive because municipalities, by their very nature, have limited sources of revenue. The property taxes and user fees that you collect largely fund operations, not capital projects. That's where you need the partnership of provincial and federal governments. The more we can help you with the capital, the more room you have to support your operating budgets. But more than that, funding needs to be substantial to maintain and improve the communities we call home. Whatever office we hold, whatever order of government we're a part of, that's what Canadians expect us to do. And if we're honest about it, Canadians are not, for the most part, all that interested in the finer details of intergovernmental funding models. They just want to be able to get to work on time or get their products to customers when expected, on a road that's in good repair, over bridges that aren't crumbling, using a rail system that they can rely on. They want to know that the water that comes out of their taps is safe to drink and that folks who need help securing an affordable place to live won't be left out in the cold. None of these things are unreasonable. None of them are unattainable when municipalities have partners who respect their experience and share their priorities. Funding also needs to be predictable so that towns and cities can properly manage their budgets and to finish, to finance existing projects and plan for future work. Stable funding will also give municipalities a revenue stream that they can borrow against. As Barry Mayor Jeff Lehman pointed out at an event focused on municipal debt, without borrowing, many projects would never see the light of day. That includes his own community's new water treatment plant, which cost about $150 million, the same amount as the city's entire capital budget. À l'heure actuelle, les taux d'intérêt sont bas. Currently, interest rates are low, and investor confidence in our municipalities is high, so this is the time to borrow intelligently and strategically. But the municipalities can't get alternative sources of income without predictable funding from other levels of government. And finally, funding needs to be sustainable. I don't think there's Anyone in the, I know there's not anyone in this room that would turn down a one-time cash infusion. But you can't draft a realistic budget or build a long-term plan or grow a community in a meaningful, deliberate, and responsive way unless you've got a partner willing and able to provide the funding you need. Today and five years from now and 10, 20, 30 years down the road. That's why an infrastructure program developed by the Liberal Party will have substantial, predictable, and sustainable funding at its very core. 
We also believe that any new project that receives federal funding needs to demonstrate a positive impact on the environment, on the economy, and on our quality of life. And how can we make sure that these criteria are met? Chiefly by making sure that the representatives your communities send to Ottawa truly represent your local priorities. That's why we're so excited about people like our latest candidates, including former Toronto Councillor Adam Vaughan and Trinity Spadina, Belleville Mayor Neil Ellis, and Winnipeg Councillor Dan Vandal. That's why we're committed to an open nomination process in each of the 338 ridings. We want leaders from every community to have a seat at the table and a seat in the House of Commons. You know, there aren't a whole lot of advantages to being the much diminished third party in the House of Commons. We've got this going for us. Tens of thousands of very eager members in ridings all across the country are looking to recruit experienced candidates. We're building a great team and we'd love for you to help. We're also focused on improving economic opportunities for Canada's middle class. I believe in partnership as a matter of principle, but also because it's what works best in practice. I've said many times over the past years that Canadians want a better government, not just a different government. A better government would be one that sees the provinces and municipalities as partners, not adversaries. One that respects the experience, the expertise, and the leadership gathered here in this room. In the 14 months that I've been leader, I've seen your leadership firsthand. I see it everywhere I go. In every community, there is local leadership dedicated to creating a better place to live and work, to building towns that young people want to return to with their families, to growing cities that have the infrastructure they need to attract new businesses and jobs. Visiting those 91 cities, towns and communities and meeting with many of the mayors and councillors in this room made one thing crystal clear. Municipal infrastructure needs are greater than ever before. There is no shortage of need. What we have to do is think strategically about what our priorities should be when it comes to infrastructure spending. To that end, we've identified six key areas that we know need greater attention today and in the long term. First up, digital connectivity particularly in urban Canada, uh, in rural Canada. That includes both wireless service and broadband access. Population distribution in Canada means that it's much more cost effective for companies to deliver services in cities, but even in urban centers like Kingston, there are still too many businesses that don't have the internet speed they need to be fully productive and competitive. And of course, the challenges are even greater in rural and remote areas. Across Canada, wireless networks have been particularly slow to build, particularly in rural BC, Manitoba, Quebec, and Newfoundland and Labrador. The government knows this is a problem and they've announced plans to expand rural broadband access. But their goals are laughable by international standards. Mr. Harper wants to give nearly all of Canadian households access to at least a five megabytes per second connection. But the Australian government plans in the same time frame to give nearly all of their households access to 100 megabytes per second. In the region, regional areas of Canada, if you don't have cell phone coverage, this is a public security problem. If you don't have access to high-speed internet, your productivity will suffer. We're not yet at the point where uh, wireless service and broadband services are as essential for us as water and electricity. However, this day is not far off. The federal government has a role to play in helping our communities to prepare for this. 
A second issue that's relevant in communities of all sizes is affordable housing. Whether you're talking about million-dollar homes in our urban centres or $800 a month rentals in smaller towns, Canadians from across the economic spectrum are finding it increasingly difficult to get affordable housing. For those who rely on subsidized housing to make ends meet, the problem is even greater with federal and provincial funding commitments set to expire. Your Federation has called on all orders of government to create a long-term housing plan that would address rising housing costs, secure, secure more stable and long-term funding, and find solutions to scarcity in the rental housing market. We support these initiatives. We are concerned, as you are, about the government's plan to eliminate rent geared to income subsidies for those living in cooperative housing. The phase-out period may be long. Subsidies won't be fully eliminated until 2032. But for many in need, the cutoff comes even sooner. Here in Niagara, Falls Place Cooperative Homes will lose its subsidy on June 1, 2019 a mere five years from now. For families, for seniors who are already struggling to make ends meet, this is devastating news. The bottom line, when one Canadian in ten is living in housing that is inadequate, unsuitable or unaffordable, more must be done. I also believe that Ottawa has a role to play in helping municipalities to create dynamic, inclusive communities. Community infrastructures like recreation centres, cultural centres, parks and green spaces give Canadians a place to enjoy themselves, to learn and to meet their neighbours. And this is all the more important since our demographics are changing, our population is ageing, there are more young people who have to travel to find work, and the cultural makeup of our communities is constantly changing. The federal funding from a Liberal government will be such that infrastructures to help new families, elderly people and a diversified population will be improved. I mean, think about it. As we close in on our 150th birthday, we need to think about reviving the kind of nation-building projects that were the hallmark of our centennial celebrations in 1967, ones that also respect the cultural realities today. This time, not just hockey arenas, but cricket fields too. Water and wastewater treatment is a fourth area of focus. Of course, unless they work for a municipality, this might not be something they think all that much about, but these are services that every single Canadian relies on every single day. Even if they never visit a community centre, even if they've never taken public transit, safe water to drink and safe treatment of wastewater is essential to the health of all Canadians. This type of infrastructure is expensive, but it's not optional. And where safe water is essential for our personal health, Transportation, the reliable movement of goods and people, is essential for our economic well-being. I'm talking here about roads, ports, airports and rail service. Much of this infrastructure, pipelines being a particularly timely example, is delivered by the private sector. Here, the role of government is to ensure that we have a functioning and efficient regulatory system that always puts public interest first. And finally, there is public transit. Last year, your former president, Barry Verbanovic, said of a proposed national transit strategy that investing in transit is investing in the future of our economy. I couldn't agree more. This is especially true in our larger cities where Lack of adequate public transit and worsening congestion are eroding our productivity. In the GTA alone, 
It's estimated that lost productivity costs us more than $6 billion every year. But there's a lot more at stake than just productivity. The very livability of our cities is threatened when our citizens don't have a sustainable, affordable way to get where they need to each and every day. Nous savons we know that effective public transit can have a transformative effect on a community. It reduces uh, pollution, traffic, it improves accessibility, and when it's properly designed, it can be a catalyst for higher density planning and will therefore create communities where people can get around more easily by bike or on foot. In short, you can draw a direct line between the widespread availability of public transit and the quality of life in our communities. But public transit comes with a tremendously high price tag, well beyond municipalities' ability to pay independently. You can't move ahead without trans uh, with transit projects without financial assistance from other levels of government. And that all starts with a commitment to develop a national transit strategy. <clears throat> Rural connectivity, affordable housing, community infrastructure, waste, wastewater treatment and water, transportation, public transit. Citizens need all orders of government to work together to get it right and to get them done. I'm looking. Right. I'm looking forward to answering your questions, so I'll wrap things up now. I do hope that I've been able to give you a better sense of how a Liberal government would approach relationships with municipal partners and an understanding of how committed we are to helping communities of all sizes work better and move better and feel more like home. We are a nation of neighbourhoods. If we want a strong country filled with neighbourhoods, towns and cities we can all be proud of, the government must build better partnerships with municipalities. Prime Minister Martin started that conversation back in 2004. It has been interrupted. I'm here to get it started again. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Mr. Trudeau. Thank you, Mr. Trudeau. <laughs> we've both been waiting a lifetime to do that. I know, that's the first time we've ever done that. <laughs> But uh, seriously, we do have some questions submitted by our delegates. By the way, you, the delegates, can submit more questions for our keynote speakers who are, will be here in the coming days. You can drop them off at the election hub, which is in the foyer. Uh, Mr. Trudeau, the first question, the uh, agreements between the federal government and the provinces over social housing are, ex are expiring. Will your party commit to using that funding for s affordable housing initiatives with the municipalities? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate the FCM for its uh, strong, uh, united voice on the issue of social housing and housing in general over the past years. Uh, I will continue as a party leader in Ottawa uh, to pressure this government to step up on housing uh, and to understand how important it is as uh, not just a social program but as an economic building block uh, necessary for the future. Uh, but more than that, I've uh, demonstrated uh, through uh, my words and my commitments, uh, not just here, but over uh, many places across the country, uh, that uh, the Liberal government is serious about partnering uh, with municipalities, with provincial partners, to make sure that housing uh, is a key element of the infrastructure plans we have. Uh, we will be funding, as partners, uh, significant investments in infrastructure for housing. In many ways, municipalities are on the front lines of climate change impacts, and the adaptation to those impacts uh, are borne by local communities. How will your party support the measures to adapt to climate change on the local level? 
Well, I think uh, we're all uh, far too aware that extreme weather events are going to be increasing both in frequency and uh, in uh, destructiveness. I had the uh, uh, pleasure is not really the right word, but it was incredible to see people pull together. Uh, the distinction of being uh, in High River and in Calgary last summer in the cleanup effort that was uh, uh, so heroically engaged in. Uh, but we have to know that uh, as uh, much as cleanup costs a community uh, and eventually the federal government, um, what we really need to be talking about is resilience. Uh, our infrastructures are not nearly enough resilient enough. Uh, we're going to need to make some very strong proactive investments in the coming years. Uh, we're going to be paying one way or another. It's just a lot better if we uh, make smart investments ahead of time uh, rather than try to foot impossible bills uh, after the, the challenges that we know are coming are headed. Uh, the other issue is, as a government, uh, it might be nice to have a Prime Minister that actually uh, understands that climate change is real and that it is up to us to do something about it. Um, and Part and parcel of that, of course, is making sure that we are adequately funding our scientists, our researchers, uh, to make sure that we are actually doing our job for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you. And since in Canada we have the police services and emergency services are in great part financed by property taxes in municipalities, how can we work together, in other words, the federal government and the municipal world, to contain costs and find a more balanced formula to fund police services and public security? As we know, the cost of public uh, police has has almost doubled over the last 10 years, but it's the municipalities who are still footing 60% of these costs. The kind of policing that we are going to need more and more of uh, is very, very much community-based. Uh, when we talk about uh, the number of uh, police officers who are now uh, frontline mental health interveners, uh, in their line of work, when we talk about the kinds of investments that communities need to make uh, to support a positive and um, proactive uh, investment in the kind of community engagement that our public services offer, particularly our police services, uh, we understand that this is something that uh, is going to be more and more of a burden on municipalities. And uh, even though we have a government that has talked a good game around law and order, uh, promising lots more investments for frontline police officers, they've never materialized. And what has materialized instead is an, uh, an emphasis on uh, prisons and enforcement uh, and punishment, as opposed to the kind of community outreach and uh, support for vulnerable and marginalized youth uh, and other groups uh, to keep our communities safe. And that's one area where actually listening, a federal government that listens to communities about their real needs in terms of public safety and crime uh, would be uh, a big step in the right direction and obviously uh, sharing the burden that all Canadians need uh, in terms of feeling safe. Thank you very much. Merci encore, Monsieur Trudeau.